Okay, so the last little while we've been talking mostly about energy, okay? Uh, we talked about the laws of thermodynamics last week, and we were looking at, uh, you know, all the different types of energy and things like that. So now we're going to be moving on to the nuts and bolts of mechanical energy, okay? But to talk really in depth about mechanical energy, we need to understand, you know, about um, how, how fast something's going, the distance it travels, all of that kind of stuff, kind of the basics of movement before we can really get into how those go together to make energy. So that's what we're looking at today, okay? We're going to look at, first off, that in physics, there are two types of measured values. There are scalar quantities and there are vector quantities, all right? Scalar quantities are measured values that have only a magnitude and units, okay? So for example, my mass, okay, would be a scalar quantity. I wouldn't tell people that I'm 78 kilograms north, right? It's because it's mostly south, but it's not, okay? I don't have a direction to my mass, okay? It's just how much of me there is. Unfortunately, there's more of it than there used to be, but, okay, it's just a number with units. It doesn't have a direction, okay? Um, whereas if I was talking about, um, let's say, um, speed, I might, or sorry, um, like velocity, for example, I might say I'm moving at 100 kilometers per hour north, okay? Which would be different than speed, which would be a scalar quantity, just saying I'm going 100 kilometers per hour. Okay, so we're going to be looking at how scalar and vector quantities um, can talk about the same thing, but they do it kind of from different perspectives. Okay, the other thing we have to realize before we start into this stuff about physics is that the way we think about movement and distance and speed in our society is completely messed up. Okay, just as a, as a society and as a culture, we think about it in totally the wrong way. I'll give you a prime example. Marty, how far is it to Edmonton? Okay. Marty is one of 10 people who have ever answered that question correctly, although it's more like 300 kilometers. But okay, it's, he actually gave me how far it is. How many of you were thinking it's about three hours? It's okay to admit it. That's how most of us think, okay? When we say how far away is something, we tell people how long it will take to get there. We just do it naturally. We don't know why. It's just the way we think, okay? What's the problem with that? I don't actually know how far it is. And secondly, time is variable. Sometimes it's three hours to Edmonton. Sometimes it's eight. It all depends on weather because weather determines how fast I can go. So there's two things that the, essentially the time that takes to Edmonton depends on. First off, how far it is to Edmonton, and secondly, how fast I can go there, all right? What doesn't change is how far it is to Edmonton. Edmonton has not gotten further away or closer to us ever, okay? It's just always in the same place. So that's why if someone asks how far is it, you should actually tell them how far it is, okay? Because most of the time, that's not what we do. Okay, and you just think about it and say, like, oh, well, it only takes 10 minutes to get there. Oh, does it? It took 10 minutes yesterday. It might take 15 minutes today. It might take five minutes tomorrow, right? It, who knows? Okay, time is variable depending on other things. All right, so key points for today. First off, we need to understand that there are many ways of measuring how far apart or how fast objects are going. We need to differentiate between distance and displacement. Okay, now. Distance and displacement both measure how far something is. Okay, one of them is vector, the other is scalar. Okay, which means they look at the same trip from different points of view. And I'm going to go into an example of that a little bit, a little bit later. Okay, but what we do need to understand is that they do look at things from different points of view. They're telling us similar things, but from different points of view, okay? Same with speed and velocity, okay? Probably up until today, you use those terms interchangeably as most people do, okay? Speed, velocity, same thing. It's how fast I'm going, except that it's not. Speed and velocity are the same as distance and displacement. They tell the same story from different points of view. Speed is a scalar quantity. It just tells me how fast I'm going. Whereas velocity tells me how fast and in what direction. Okay, so speed is scalar. 
That's why you get a speeding ticket, not a velocitying ticket. Okay. If you're going 150 on the deer foot, you're going to get a speeding ticket. If you're going 150 on the deer foot northbound in the southbound lanes, that's a separate ticket. Okay. You're going the wrong way and too fast. Okay. That's something entirely different. All right, so velocity and speed look at the same idea, okay, but again, from different points of view. All right, and then we're going to solve problems related to motion using the first formula, okay, or formulas, formulae, that we will use in this unit. And that's these two formulas. V equals D over T and V equals D over T. I'm not going crazy. Those are different formulas. Okay, this V is speed. This D is distance, and this T is time. This V is velocity. This one's displacement, and this one's time. Okay, anything that has an arrow over top of it is a vector quantity. Okay, so if it has an arrow over top of it, it's a vector quantity. That indicates it has magnitude and direction, right? So that's why those formulas are different. And again, I'm going to go through an example that shows you just how different distance and displacement, speed and velocity can be. Okay, what about time? Is time scalar or vector? It's scalar. Because as far as we know, time can only go forward. Yeah, okay. It doesn't have a direction. It only, it just exists. It happens and passes. Okay. It doesn't, it's not something that at least as far as we know, okay, can go in any other direction. I mean, if, if, you know, maybe we develop a time machine, then maybe time becomes a vector quantity then. Okay. Maybe we can even go sideways in time. I don't know how you do that, but okay, whatever. Okay. If, for right now, we treat time as a scalar quantity. It doesn't have any direction. Okay. All right. So, if you've ever gone hiking off trail or done any like orienteering, anything like that, okay, you know that that example I used there a minute ago where like Marty totally ruined my demonstration by actually giving me the right answer, okay, um, you know that the way we describe distance is just wrong and it's only going to get you really lost in a trackless environment, okay. Um, so as an example here, okay, this is a, a hike that my father and I did when we were both much younger um, and it's tough. It's like 210 kilometers over seven days. Um, but in our, in, on our map here, okay, like when we were doing this actual hike, okay, you'd come across signs on the trail, all right? So when we're right here, okay, here at point number one, which is um, seldom in campground, okay, when we're there and we're just about to leave the campground, it says um, Snake Indian Falls Campground, 28 kilometers, did it just give me a vector description of where that is or a scalar description of where that is? It gave me a scalar description. What is it assuming I'm going to do? It assumes I'm going to follow the trail, which is smart. Not following the trail would be very difficult. Shorter, but very difficult. Okay, So it assumes that this is the 28 kilometers, this red line here. Okay, That's the distance from Seldom Inn to Snake Indian Falls Campground. All right. If the sign was giving me the displacement, okay, it would assume I had a helicopter or something because there's no way I could walk here, okay, across this green line. Okay, there's no way I could walk across that because there's like big giant rivers and canyons and glaciers and all other manner of disaster between those two points. Okay, but it would probably say something like, uh, you know, Snake Indian Falls Campground is, um, let's say, 19 kilometers at 50 degrees west of north. Okay, and then I would have to stand here with my compass and go, okay, so there's north, and I'm going to go 50 degrees west of north, so I'm going to walk that way. Okay, and then I would have to keep that track, okay, keep in a straight line along that track across all manner of disaster to get there. Okay, what is the likelihood of me being able to do that? Not very good, not on foot anyway. Like I say, if I had a helicopter, it'd be easy, right? I'd just you know, point the compass that direction and fly there and set down. Of course, it kind of defeats the purpose, but okay, I'd be able to do it at least. Everyone kind of following me on the difference there? 
Okay, so one's a vector quantity. It describes the same trip. I'm going from one place to the other, right? But I got kind of two choices on how I get there, right? When I get from here to there and I follow the, the trail, because that's the most logical way, I have also still done this trip. I just didn't actually walk that way, okay? But if I, you know, just kind of looked at my initial position and my final position, okay, that would be the line that connects them. That's my displacement. Okay. My displacement describes how far and in what direction I have gone from my initial position to my final position. The distance tells me how far I actually went, okay? because I couldn't actually travel in a straight line. So that's the difference between the two. They're describing the same trip, okay? but one is telling me what I actually did, and I can't give a direction on this because there's lots of different directions on the red line. Okay? And this one is telling me, here's what you, here's how far you displaced yourself, or here's how far and in what direction you changed your position. Right? So displacement is telling me about my change in position, whereas distance is telling me how far I actually had to go. Okay? Is that making some sense? Okay, so they're a little bit different, but again, still describing the same trip. Okay, so scalars and vectors, okay, if we're talking about, you know, getting to Calgary from Okotoks, and let's say we're talking about getting to, I don't know, like maybe the airport or something, okay, we'd say Calgary's 40 kilometers away. We don't make any reference to which direction it is because there's a road that goes from here to there, and we would assume most people would follow it. So 40 kilometers is a scalar description. It's the distance you would have to travel to get from Okotoks to Calgary, okay? Okay. Um, if we wanted to give a vector description, okay, then we would say it's 40 kilometers at 13 degrees east of north. Okay, so because due north would be like like this. Okay, so we'd be going slightly east of that in order to get there. Everybody all right with that? Okay, nobody would actually go that way again unless they had the capability of going in a straight line. That would require probably a helicopter. Okay, all right. Now, um, which is more accurate, a scalar description or a vector description? Which do you think would be more accurate? Yeah, and that's the way we lean, is that vector would be more accurate. But in actual fact, and here's another thing about physics, accuracy has nothing to do with how much information you give. It has to do with how did you measure it, okay? So if I say it's 40 kilometers at 13 degrees east of north, or it's just 40 kilometers, those are equally accurate because they're measured to the same accuracy, okay? They're measured to the nearest kilometer, okay? I know that Calgary, if I tell them it's 40 kilometers, is accurate. It's 40 kilometers plus or minus one kilometer. Okay. If I measured it this way, that would be more accurate. Now it's accurate to plus or minus 0.1 kilometers or 100 meters. That number is more accurate than these numbers are. So accuracy comes from how you measure, not whether it's vector or scalar. It's possible to give a vector description that has more information that's actually less accurate in terms of how it was measured. Okay, Everyone follow me there. Okay, so remember that accuracy has nothing to do with whether it's vector or scalar. It has to do with how it was measured. Okay. All right, so let's talk about this. Oh, I did that too early. I thought I had that example somewhere. Okay, we're going to use this example here, but I'm going to redraw it without that line. Okay, so let's say that I want to walk from my house nice house, okay, to Walmart. Unless I live right behind Walmart and I don't, okay, I can't walk in a straight line from my house to Walmart, agreed? Right, because then I'd have to walk through buildings and that would be cool, but not possible. Okay, so I have to follow like, you know, the roads and the sidewalks and whatever else. So, okay, if I walk from my house to Walmart, you know, I've got to do this. And then, you know, I got to cross like the river on the bridge. And then okay, I end up over here. Okay. 
Okay, at Wally World, Walmart, Sprawl Mart, whatever name you have for it. Okay, so let's say that when I walk that, okay, that that ends up being 4.0 kilometers. Let's just say it comes out to four kilometers. Okay. Is that distance or displacement? That's distance, okay? That's the distance that I have walked. All right, um, that means that my displacement then would be the line I erased a minute ago, this line. Okay, is that shorter? It is, but I can't actually walk it. But I have done that. In walking from my house to Walmart, that is how much my position has changed. Right, so let's just say that for argument's sake, it is two point seven kilometers at thirty degrees south of east. We'll just say that that's the direction I went. Okay, how do I know that's south of east? Why did I write south of east and not southeast? Right. Exactly southeast is 45 degrees south of east and 45 degrees east of south, okay? This is, okay, whenever we draw a line like that, okay, we measure it from some primary compass direction. So this is east, okay? This line here would be east and I went 30 degrees south of it, okay? I can't say 30 degrees southeast because there are two 30 degrees southeast and they don't point the same direction, okay? All right. So I've gone 30 degrees south of east, okay, 2.7 kilometers. So I'm actually only in a straight line 2.7 kilometers from my house, okay, even though I had to walk four kilometers to end up there, right? So again, I'm describing the same trip, but from two different points of view, okay? Everyone following the difference between distance and displacement? Okay, now comes the difference between speed and velocity. If this takes me a half an hour, all right, so this is going to be... Whoop, This is going to be my distance. This is going to be my displacement. Let's say that the time it takes me is a half an hour. How fast was I walking? Eight kilometers per hour, right? I went four kilometers in a half an hour. I would have kept walking. I would have gone eight kilometers in an hour. So I'm going eight kilometers per hour. Okay. How did I figure that out? I did this. Speed equals distance divided by time. I went four kilometers in one half an hour, okay, which gave me eight kilometers per hour. Okay, that is my speed. That's V without the arrow over top. Okay, that's my speed. What's my velocity? Same or different number? No, nope. going to be a different number because velocity is vector, right? So while speed tells me how fast I'm going, velocity tells me how fast I'm changing my position, including what direction I'm going because it's a vector quantity, okay? So while the formula is similar, okay, velocity is displacement divided by time. So that means 2.7 kilometers at 30 degrees south of east divided by half an hour. Right, so now I'm going to get that my velocity is 5.4 kilometers per hour at 30 degrees south of east. Okay, because time didn't have a direction, the direction stays the same. Okay. It also makes sense that if I changed my position 30 degrees south of east, that's the direction I was walking. My, my velocity should have the same direction. Okay. I can't end up, let's say, 200 kilometers east by going 100 kilometers an hour north. Right? My velocity and my displacement always have the same vector. They have to. Okay. Everybody all right with that? Okay. So not a tough calculation. I right? would just plug in numbers in. All right, because I'm old, I get to Wally World and I realize that I don't have my wallet. Since I'm not a person who walks around a store to look at crap, 
I just turn around and go home because I can't accomplish my mission that I was going to whatever to get some piece of junk there. Okay, so I turn around and I walk back home along exactly the same path at exactly the same rate. So after one whole hour, I'm back at home. What a waste of time. How far have I gone? I've gone eight kilometers. It's four kilometers there. It's four kilometers back. What's my overall speed? Eight kilometers per hour. Okay, that's easy. What's my displacement now that I'm back at home? Hmm? Nope. Nope. Remember that. Okay, I'll give you nothing. Displacement is my change in position. Since I started at home and ended at home, I didn't change my position at all. I just walked for an hour and accomplished nothing. Okay? My displacement is now zero because I'm back where I started. That's where vector and scalar quantities can really start to give you different answers. Okay? Yeah, I walked eight kilometers, but I didn't end up going anywhere because I ended up back where I started. All right, everyone kind of follow me there. Okay, now that also means then that my overall velocity is zero. Okay, right here, guys, we calculated velocity by taking displacement divided by time. If my displacement is zero, the overall velocity for that whole trip is zero because I didn't go anywhere. Okay? I ended up back at home and didn't go anywhere. All right, questions on how that works. Okay, in your car, you have this thing that's usually right underneath or part of the speedometer, okay? And it tells you how many kilometers are on your car. It's called the odometer. Does it read the distance you've traveled or your displacement? Distance, okay? Because if it read displacement, what would it read every time you came home? No, it would read how far it is from the dealership you bought it at to your house. Come on, people, wake up. Every time you take it in for an oil change at the dealership, it'll read zero. I catch everybody. No one has ever given me the right answer on that question. Okay. Everybody goes zero because they think you're at home. Okay, so it doesn't read displacement because that would be useless unless you were trying to sell it, in which case you could say, well, this car only has 4.5 kilometers on it because that's how far it was from the dealership to your house. Okay, it'd be great to try and sell a car with only four and a half kilometers on it, except that you could have driven it around the world a hundred times. Okay, it could have hundreds of thousands of kilometers on it. Okay, that's why it reads the distance you've driven the car. Okay, that's more practical. It tells them, you know, essentially how much the car has been used. Okay. All right. Is this making sense? Okay, so just have to remember difference between distance and displacement, speed and velocity. All right. Um, now, this here was, uh, I was talking about this a minute ago. It said it says more accurate. I think I changed your notes to read something else, right? I don't say, I said descriptive, I think, in your notes. I keep forgetting to. Okay, a more descriptive description is a vector description, okay? Because a vector description has not just the magnitude, the measured value, it also has the direction, which is also a measured value, okay? Um, so 40 kilometers on a vector of 13 degrees east of north. Again, we've said 40 kilometers for both, okay? The, the difference, they're, they're equally accurate, just one has uh, a vector or a direction on it as well, okay? For us in science 10, we're not going to use uh, angles, okay? Because that brings in the trigonometry and all of that kind of stuff. We save that for physics 20, okay? In science 10, we only deal with what we call one-dimensional vectors. So that's forward and backward, left and right positive and negative, north and south, whatever, okay? We'll only ever have back and forth, okay? There'll be one-dimensional vectors only. You won't have to go off on angles and do sine, cos, and tan and all that, okay? We save that for uh, when you get to physics 20. All right. Okay, so difference between distance and displacement. So the distance, okay, when we give the distance an object has traveled, that's a scalar quantity, okay? When we give the displacement, okay, that's going to be, um, that's going to be our vector description, all right? So distance and displacement are different measures of the same thing. Well, you might actually have to travel four kilometers, okay? You only end up 2.8 kilometers in a straight line from where you started, all right? So it's just important to recognize the difference there, okay? So 
distance, if we wanted to kind of summarize that. Distance is how far, okay? Displacement. Okay. Displacement is your change in position with direction, which is actually why on your formula sheet, which I have to give you this week, okay, it actually says that displacement is your final position minus your initial position. Okay. All right, so like I said, uh, displacement is going to be your change in position okay, uh, with direction. All right? And we often calculate that by going final position minus the initial position. That will become more important when we start talking about graphs later this week, okay? All right, same type of idea with speed and velocity, okay? Speed is a measure of the distance traveled in a time interval, all right? So speed is a measure of the distance traveled during a certain time interval and thus is a scalar quantity, okay? So speed is how fast? Okay, whereas velocity is the rate of change of position. And again, that has direction. Is it ever possible for distance and displacement to be the same number? Yeah, it is, as long as you went in a perfectly straight line. Okay, so if you walked straight down the street, okay, then yes, your distance and your displacement would have the same magnitude. They wouldn't be the same because the displacement would say it's 200 meters down the street, okay, or east or whatever direction down the street is, okay, whereas the distance would just be 200 meters. Right. Same idea here for speed and velocity. Speed and velocity can have the same magnitude if you are traveling in a straight line in one direction. Okay. If not, okay, then they're going to be different. Okay, and then this last paragraph here was exactly what we did with the Walmart trip. By the time I get back home, if I followed exactly the same route, okay, then my displacement and my velocity will both be zero because my position has not changed over the course of time. Okay, now we got to look at algebra, okay? So the formula you're going to be using, V You'll see why I did those different colors in a minute. All right, so right now that formula is set up to solve for speed, or V. I want to solve for D. What do I have to do? Right, multiply both sides by time. Okay, so that just means bring time over here. So now time equals, or sorry, uh, T times V equals D. All right, think about that. All right, if you're traveling at 100 kilometers per hour, how far will you go in three hours? 300 kilometers. Did you do exactly that? Yes. Okay, so that formula kind of makes sense then. All right. What if I want to solve for T? You didn't have to do this with the mole equation. That was the one that was always on the bottom. You never had to move it. I never had to solve for it. Can I solve for something if it's under a dividing line? Not leaving it under the dividing line. Because a lot of people just say, oh, Mr. Coderre, why don't you just divide both sides by D? Bring D over here. And that's solving for T. Is that solving for T? No, nope. that's solving for 1 over T. Okay, Because what I did to move this D over here was I went, I divided both sides by D. Well, D divided by D is 1. It doesn't make it go away. It's like 2 divided by 2. It's 1. All right. So if there's a 1 on the top, 1 over T is not the same 
as t. All right, so I'm just going to undo all the crap we did here. All right, I want to solve for t. I need to make sure that it's on the top of the equation. So I'm going to do what I did in the last one, and I'm going to multiply both sides by t. I'm going to bring it over here. Okay, and then what am I going to do with v? Right, because I want t by itself, so I'm going to divide v over here. Okay, t equals d over v. Edmonton's 300 kilometers from here, and you can travel at 100 kilometers per hour. How long will it take? It's 300 kilometers from here. You can go 100 kilometers per hour. How long will it take? Three hours. Did we just do that? We went 300 divided by 100, and we got three hours. Okay? So it's nothing that you don't do in your head all the time. All right? So don't let the algebra intimidate you. Also, do not let the algebra make you think that doing one of these would be okay, because I'll kill you. Okay? Triangles are not cool. They suck. Well, they're a wannabe square, but they're short aside. Come on. Like, okay. Here's the reason triangles suck. Okay. You're going to have to use this formula probably by the end of the week. Got a triangle for that? No, because it has an addition operation in it. So a triangle won't work. See, triangles suck. Okay. No, you can't add to the triangle. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Here's a new one for you. Here's try this one. VF minus VI over T equals A. Got a triangle for that one. It's not a bigger triangle. There's no triangle for that. Okay. How about this one then, smart Alec? I don't know. You need like a trapezoid or something. Okay. Like there's no, there's no shape that's going to help you if you take physics 20. Yes. Okay. That calculates the period of a pendulum based on its length and the acceleration due to gravity. Okay? There's all kinds of incredibly cool, useful formulas that cannot be manipulated using a damn triangle. Okay? Triangles are a crutch. And if you continue to use a crutch, your leg will never get stronger. For temporary, no one expects you to use your crutch for the rest of your life. Then you would have a wheelchair. Yeah. Okay. then you're incredibly resilient, but you didn't use a triangle. So, okay, my point is made though, right? You didn't need a triangle. So here's what we got to think about, guys. There's a couple of rules of algebra that we need to know, all right? I want you to write down these three rules of algebra. They're simple, simple rules, okay? When manipulating an equation, the first rule of algebra is, if you want to move something, you do the opposite. Okay, so if I want to move a variable that's being divided, I will. What's the opposite of, mul of divided? Multiply. If, I'm, if I want to move something that's being added, then I would subtract. Okay, it's just, that's the way it's going to go. If you want to move something, you do the opposite operation. We're going to look at this in terms of that y equals mx plus b formula here right away. Okay, so the first rule of algebra is if you want to move something, do the opposite. The second rule of algebra, what you do to one side of an equation, you must do to the other. Sometimes we call that the golden rule of algebra. All right, and then our third rule of algebra, okay? When solving for a variable, Move what is not attached to it first. And I'll explain what I mean by that here in just a minute. All right, so let's look at these three rules in action using the graphing equation. Okay, so in the graphing equation, we have that y equals m times x plus b. How many of you have taken that in math already? Okay, so one or two of you. It'll, it'll be coming if you've taken with that. Uh, grade eight, you probably learned rise over run, but if your grade eight math teacher taught you that, they're awesome. Yeah, okay. Mr. Zanoni did? Zanoni's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's what we got, okay? If I want to solve for, let's say, 
uh, m. Let's say I want to solve for m in this equation. Right? The rules of algebra say, first off, I gotta, if I want to move something, I gotta do the opposite. Okay? And what I do to one side, I do to the other. And I gotta move what's not attached first. So what's not directly attached to m? B. Okay? B is not directly attached to m. So if I want to move b, I need to do the opposite of add it. I need to subtract it from both sides. Okay? So what I end up doing is I go minus b, okay? minus b, and this is what I end up with. y minus b equals m times x, because b minus b is 0. All right. Now, I still want to get m by itself, but x is still over there. Right now, I'm multiplying m and x together, so what do I do to move x? Divide. Boom. Okay, I've just manipulated that equation to solve for m. Okay, wasn't overly difficult. I subtracted one thing, I divided another, and I'm done. Okay, I've solved for m, no problem at all. All right, let's say instead of solving for m, I want to solve for b. What should I do if I want to solve for b? Right, I want to move m and x over to the other side. Can I move them together? I can. I can move them together because if I was doing order of operations, would I multiply them together before I added them to b? Okay, so really m times x is really just a single number then. All right, so if I want to move it to the other side, I should subtract it. Yeah. y minus m times x equals b. Okay? As long as we think logically about an equation, we shouldn't have any trouble moving anything around in it. Okay? And you guys don't have really complex formulas that you're going to have to manipulate. Okay? Between this and this one, those are probably the two most complex formulas you'll have to manipulate in this course. Okay? I mean, there's some other formulas that integrate many formulas into one, but they're, they're still not that difficult. Okay? So let's look at the the one here with the A and the V's and stuff. Okay, this is actually your acceleration formula, which you'll be using probably before the end of the month. Okay. So let's say I want to solve for VF. What should I move first? These are attached, right? They're together, but this is separate. Can I move t first? Okay. And right now I'm dividing by t. So what do I do to move it? I multiply. All right. So I've got a times t equals vf minus vi. All right. I'm trying to get vf. So what do I do with vi? What's the opposite of subtract? Add. Okay. So I'm going to add vi to both sides. So I've got a times t plus vi equals VF. What this formula calculates, guys, is this is acceleration. Acceleration is your change in velocity divided by time. All right. So if I want to calculate my final velocity, I take the change in velocity and add whatever I started with. Okay. So what I started with plus however much I changed by gives me my final. As long as we think logically about an equation and follow the three rules of algebra, okay, we can't go wrong. Okay? Manipulating equations is way easier than you have probably been led to believe. Okay? Because unfortunately, our society has this stereotype about math. Okay? It first off says that math is hard, and the second thing it says is that nobody's good at it, which is total crap. Okay? People are inherently good at math, provided it doesn't get like crazy. Okay, like once you start into calculus, then there's people who are good at math and people who aren't so good at math. But up until then, okay, pre-calculus stuff, everybody can do that. Okay, we've just been led to believe we can't, which is wrong. Okay, because I hear that from my kids all the time. Oh, I hate math. I'm not good at math, and they sit down and do a whole problem sheet. I'm like, okay, and they've never been told by me they weren't good at math. Right? But there's this thing in society that says, oh, I'm not good at math, and that's hard. That's dumb. Okay? Don't let people tell you that. Okay, um, so oh, I've got that twice. Okay, so we've done that. All right, I want you guys to write this example down.
and then we'll try it together here. Okay, so just write down this example, I'll give you a minute, and then we'll walk through its solution. All right, so similar to how we would have tackled this if it was a mole equation question, the first thing I want to do is write down the givens the question gave me. All right, so it says, first off, how far will a deer, okay, how far is asking us to calculate what? Distance. All right, so distance is my unknown here. Will a deer running at 15 meters per second, what did they give me there? Speed. How do I know that wasn't a velocity? There's no direction on it, right. Okay, travel in 45 seconds, that's a time. All right, so I've got V, I've got T, and I'm looking for D, all right? So you get one mark for your givens, okay? This is my formula here, V equals D over T, because it's the only formula I have that has all of those things in it. I need to manipulate for D. So what do I have to do with T? Multiply by both sides. All right, T times V equals D. So that'll be 15 uh, meters per second times 45 seconds. Six hundred and seventy five meters. What's that? Yep. It is. Deer are pretty fast though when they get moving. You'd be surprised. You think bullet can run almost forty. And he ain't gonna outrun a deer. A cheetah can run at almost 70 miles an hour, right? Just like 115 kilometers an hour. So, <laughs> all right, does everyone follow what we did there? Okay, so nothing terribly difficult, right? You get a mark for your givens, okay? Um, you get a mark for picking the correct formula because once they give you your formula sheet, there'll be lots on there to pick from. Okay, get a mark for your manipulation and number plugging and then a mark for the answer. So like a four mark question. Okay, nothing too terrible difficult. Okay, I don't know why I didn't erase all the solutions from here before. Oops. Okay. Try this one. You're looking for how long it'll take a tortoise to crawl 200 meters at a speed of 0.25 meters per second. All right, so again, we want to set it up, okay, with our, with our givens first. Okay, it's crawled 200 meters, so that's a distance. Okay, it's not a displacement because they didn't tell me what direction. Okay, at a speed of 0.25 meters per second, they're looking for how long that will take, so they're looking for time. Right, so again, V equals D over T is my formula. I'm trying to solve for T, so I'm going to multiply both sides by T, and then I'm going to divide both sides by V, and we'll end, what I'll end up with is distance over speed equals time. So that'll be 200 meters divided by 0.25 meters per second, which should be 800 seconds, right? What's that? Minutes, yes, 13 minutes to go 200 meters. You can walk that in like a minute and a half, two minutes. Okay. All right. Um, questions on how that one worked? All right. Now, this one will be a little bit trickier because it has more than one part. Okay. So, something that we need to be aware of about the formula we've just been using. Okay. This formula here, velocity equals displacement divided by time, okay, actually means average, can also mean, sorry, average velocity equals total displacement over total time. Okay, so we can use it in its kind of singular form like this, just for a part of the trip, and we can use it over the whole trip, provided we have these numbers, the total displacement and the total time. All right, so we have a bus that travels 100 kilometers north in 1.2 hours, and then turns around and comes back 62 kilometers south in 0.9 hours. We're looking for the average velocity of the bus. Okay, so to get the average velocity of the bus, we need the total displacement 
and the total time. All right, let me give you guys a few minutes, see if you can figure that one out. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. So what I have to look at here is if I'm going to get the average velocity over the entire trip, I need the total displacement and the total time, which for this question aren't difficult things to find. You know, I know that in part one of the trip, okay, we go uh, 100 kilometers north, so we have a displacement of 100 kilometers north, okay, and that that takes 1.2 hours. Okay, and then in part two, okay, the displacement is 62 kilometers, but now south. Okay, and so that's going to mean, uh, and that time is uh, 0.9 hours, right? All right, so I've got kind of D and T, and I've got D and T. Now, what a lot of people unfortunately do here is they go, oh, average. And when you calculate the average, you take all the parts and you add them together and then you divide by the number of parts. Do I want to do that here? No. Okay. First off, it's more calculating than you need to do. And secondly, it won't give me the right answer. Okay. Here's why it won't give me the right answer. If I calculate the velocity in part one and then calculate the velocity in part two, add them together and divide by two, I have said that part one and part two represent equal parts of the trip. Do they? No. Part one is significantly more of this trip than part two is. Not only is it farther, it's also longer. Okay, so I don't want to do that because then I'm treating them like they're equal parts and they're not. Okay, that's why I want to take the total displacement and divide by the total time. It essentially finds me the weighted average, taking into account that more of the trip was traveled at uh, in part one than it was in part two, where the velocity was obviously higher. Everyone follow me on that. Okay. Doing it the other way would be the equivalent of saying I traveled 120 kilometers per hour toward Edmonton for 290 kilometers. And the last 10 kilometers, I had to slow down to 50. So I'm going to go 50 plus 100 and divide by 2, and that's going to be my average velocity. It's not even close to that. I traveled way, I've traveled 95 to 97% of the trip at 120. Only the last part of the trip that I have to slow down, the last 10 kilometers, that's not half. Okay. They're certainly not equal parts of the trip. Everyone okay with that? All right, so if I want to find the total displacement, I'm going to add these two numbers together, keeping in mind that this one is south, and south compared to north would be opposite or negative. All right, so I'm going to say, all right, 100 plus negative 62 divided by the times. So I just found the total displacement by adding those together. And then I'll add the times together. So um, 1.2 plus 0.9. There's my total displacement divided by my total time. Is it okay that I didn't make the 0.9 negative? I made the 62 negative. Should I make the 0.9 negative? No, time can't be negative. I went 62 kilometers south, not 62 kilometers south and back in time. That would be weird and impossible. All right. So what I end up with is that my total displacement is 38 kilometers north divided by 2.1 hours. All right, and when I do that, I should get 18.1 kilometers per hour north. Yeah, you can go 100 minus 60. Mathematically, it's the same thing. Whichever makes more sense in your head, I'm fine with. I'm just showing you that to do totals, technically, I add. Right? But if, yeah, if you want to do it that way, that's fine. Okay. Now, would I lose a mark if I didn't include the north? Yes, because it asked for a vector quantity. If you tell me that the velocity was 18.1 kilometers per hour, you did not give me a velocity. You gave me a speed. Okay. So you didn't give me what the question asked for. All right. Any questions on how that one worked? Because that's more like what you'll be doing, and you know, like just doing v equals d over t is kind of beneath you. Okay? You guys know how to manipulate equations and do that kind of stuff. So these are a little bit more challenging. Okay. Um, all right. So we talked a little bit about this at the beginning. Okay. Scalar quantities have magnitude only. Right. So they just have a measured value with units. Okay, so speed, that's V, okay, D, 65 kilometers, mass, 75 kilograms, time, four days, those are all scalar quantities. 
right? Whereas vector quantities, okay, they have magnitude and direction. So we got displacement, we got velocity, okay? Those things would be, okay, they would have a kilometers per hour south or, you know, meters north or whatever it happens to be. Okay, so we just have to remember that. And then I was talking about this here a minute ago. Average speed is total distance divided by total time, okay? And average velocity is total displacement divided by total time. All right, so remember that those formulas can be used in a singular way or okay, over an entire trip. You just have to have the right information to do that. Okay. All right, like I say, I'm going to give you a formula sheet here on later in the week, uh, but for right now, that's the only formula you need to remember, V equals D over T for now. And we did one like that already. And we did one like that already. And one like that already. All right, try this one. This is a little better. Okay, so I got an elevator that travels up 85 meters in 30 seconds and then turns and travels 60 meters down in 20 seconds. I want to know both the average speed and the average velocity. So in the first part of this question, okay, I've got the elevator traveling upwards, okay? So that the displacement here is 85 meters up, and that takes uh, 30 seconds. And then in part two, all right, the distance trial or the displacement, sorry, is 60 meters down. And that takes 20 seconds. All right, so now we have our displacements and our time. So this is going to be just like the one we did before. Okay, if I want to calculate the average velocity, I'm going to need the total displacement divided by the total time. All right, so the total displacement is going to be 85 plus negative 60, and I'm going to divide that by 50 seconds. All right, so I'm going to have um, 25 over 50, so the average velocity is 0.5 meters per second up. Everybody all right with that? Okay, now to get the speed, I need the total, not displacement, but distance. All right, so instead of making 60 negative, now I'm going to treat it like it's just a distance, just a scalar quantity. All right, so I'm going to have, eight, I went 85 meters, then I went another 60 meters. From a scalar perspective, that's what happened. It doesn't care. Okay, scalar quantities don't care if I went up or down. Okay, just how far did I go? So now I'm going to have that speed, whoops, without the arrow, equals distance over time. So that's going to be 145 meters divided by 50 seconds. Okay, it's going to be a much larger number now. Right, because again, it doesn't care that I went up and then came back towards where I started from. Just how far did I go in total? Right, so we got our uh, 145 divided by 50, a okay, much larger number, 2.9 meters per second, with no direction. Right, because I went up and down during that trip. Okay, everybody, all right with that? Okay, not again, not difficult calculations once we understand what we have to do. Okay, write this one down and give it a try. I don't know if we'll get it done today or not, but we can talk about it tomorrow. What's that? Write down the question, yeah, and then you can get started on it. 